I'm, I'm here today to beg you, to, to beg you to be more self-centered and, and to tell you that what the, world, what the world needs today is actually more people who are self-centered. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Brett's lost his mind. Uh, he, he's crazy. How in the world could he be suggesting that we need more of that? We have plenty of that already. And, and you're also thinking that self-centered people are those people that they put themselves first at the expense of others. I'd like to suggest a different definition, that self-centered is, yeah, putting yourself first, but actually investing in yourself because of other people and for the benefit of other people. The world, it does, it needs more self-centered people. And why? Because the world needs you and, and you and you, each of you, to live from the core of your passions. The, the world doesn't need another person spending their time doing what they think other people need from them or what they think other people think they should be doing. That's not sacrifice. That's tragedy. And most people, they don't realize it. Most people have no idea they're living just a small fraction of their true potential. T to most people, their, their version of normal is actually lazy or average or, or, or just getting by. As Henry David Thoreau so famously wrote many, many years ago, most men lead lives of quiet desperation, and they go to their grave with their song still in them. I, I know for me, and th this is a scary thought, that I was one decision away from not being aware that I was living an uninspired life. I, I was one decision away from not being awakened to my true purpose. And I could have easily been on that same but very wrong path here today and, and not know that. See, I was marching through life according to other people's expectations with the outward appearance of a very successful life. But inwardly and, and secretly, desperately, I was bound by fear. I was living a life that was just a fraction of the one that God had intended for me. When I was in junior high school, I remember having a kind of a goofy goal. Actually, for me, it was more of a dream. My dream was that I would know every kid in the school by name, literally, and it was a large school. I didn't care. I didn't care if they were a big athlete or a, or a freak or a nerd <laughs> or rich or poor. None of that mattered to me. What mattered to me was that I would know them. And I, I could walk down the hallway in school and say hi to any and every kid, and they would say hi back to me. During high school, and even to this day, one of my favorite jobs was when I was a teller at a local bank. I, I loved working with people. And I remember having another kind of a goofy goal. It was a challenge to myself of how quickly could I convert a few cranky old customers into one day being happy, smiley people through their interaction with me at my teller window. Well, as the high school years went along, it became time. It became time to, to choose a college and a degree program and a career. And for some reason, this, this people-loving young man, I jumped in, I chose to be an engineer. <laughs> I chose the highest paying job, job that I could find that required a four year degree. Now, I was not good at science, I was not good at math, I had no interest at all in mechanical things. <laughs> I knew, I knew that being a teacher or a bank worker or anything to deal with people would have been a lot more fun. But for some reason, I chose to chase money instead of my dream. I, I somehow got through school and I got that degree, and other than the time for a year with Remax, I went and got a job as an engineer, which I hated, and I went and got my MBA and I moved away as quickly as I could from non-technical roles. Twenty years went by like that. And during that time, I got married, I raised three wonderful children. I had a great family, a great career, a great life, great life. But only on the outside, on the inside, things were wrong, terribly wrong. You see, I found myself spending 10, 11, 12 hours a day, every day in my office, or before that in my little bitty cubicle, with my face inches away from my computer screen, staring at Excel sheets and PowerPoint graphs and and answering emails and phone calls and going to meeting after meeting after meeting. To then drive home and get out and 
go in and have dinner and do the dishes and put the kids to sleep and put myself to bed and then get up the next morning and drive back to the office and get out and go in and do that same thing over and over and over again. I began to feel like I was literally on a treadmill going faster and faster and faster, trading my limited time for money and going absolutely nowhere. Now, I'm not suggesting those jobs I did were bad or evil or, or not good. They were great jobs. I had a great career. Just not right for me. You see, I wasn't meeting people. I wasn't adding to my network. And that little boy in me, that little boy desperately wanted to meet new people. And I began to see and feel the contradiction between my tiny inward focused life and the universe that I began to recognize for the first time truly is infinite and expanding. And I began to wonder, could I make a change? I saw how diverse the economy was all around me. Could, could I make a change where I could actually have an impact on other people's lives? And it hit me. It hit me. It was up to me what I could do and how many people that I could add to my world. But I was living in contradiction. And I'm here today to call that type of life for what it is. It's not servanthood. It's not being generous or self-sacrificing or loving. It is a lie. And I'm here today to ask you a question. You. Not your friends or your family, but you. Could it be possible that you, too, are living a lie? Could you be here today betraying the core, the essence of who you were designed to be? You have an opportunity. In fact, you have an obligation to design and live your own life. Imagine, just imagine, if everybody in this room, or better yet, if everybody on the planet were actively living their personal purpose and passion, how incredibly wonderful this world would be. But we live in a very different world, a world driven by a very different mechanism, a mechanism that I know far too well. What is it that prevents us from making decisions to go out and live from the core of our passions? The answer is simple. It's fear. Let me give you a couple. How about money? Many people fear not having enough money. Other people actually fear having too much money. I know for me, I feared both. I love my mother and father very, very much. In many ways, they're my heroes. They were young when they had me. My mom was only 18 years old. A year later, they had twins. I can't begin to imagine how difficult that time must have been for them. Yet my young parents were great parents, and they raised us, my brother and sister and I, in a loving, happy, safe environment. One problem. My young parents talked openly and negatively about successful people. They resented rich people. And they hated salespeople. And they poured these thoughts deep inside this little boy's head way before I can remember. Well, guess what? I am a salesperson. <laughs> and guess what? I'd like to make a little money. I'd like to be successful. The conflict. Do I live my life, or do I live a completely different life to gain my parents' approval? And then, and what if? What if I don't make enough money? No, seriously. What if I don't, and I can't pay the bills, and we lose our house, and I can't feed my family? And, and then, but what if I make too much money? All these what ifs. The irony is, these money fears, they're all lies. You're, you're not going to go hungry, and you're not going to be homeless, and and your parents, they're going to still love you. Most of what we fear never happens anyway. How differently would we live if we didn't fear money? But then again, fear of money is actually a symptom of a deeper problem, a deeper fear. A fear of being rejected. A fear of not being included. This fear, fear of what other people would think of me, is what was guiding my life. For many of us, Fear of other people and what they think can drive every major decision we make. The, the, 
the places that we live, the people we spend our time with, the jobs that we take or do, the things that we do, more importantly, maybe, the things that we don't do. Fear of others and what they think, it's not always obvious. It can sometimes mask itself. Sometimes it takes the form of putting other people first. When, when my ex-wife and I got married, we made a covenant to each other. Our covenant was that if, if I would always put her first, and if she would always put me first, that we would have the perfect marriage. So during that time, every decision that I made was based on a calculation, a calculation of, of what would she want and what would she need and, and what would she think. And more fundamentally, what would she think of me? The truth is, if your identity is rooted in your perception of what other people want or think or need from you, you might spend your days putting them first, but you won't be loving them well. It's important that you understand what your true passions are deep inside your heart and that you're free to pursue those passions. Actually, this is more than important. It's an obligation. God created you. And he created you with a unique purpose and passion and missions and drives and a charge to grow in those. Don't let life just happen to you. You might be saying to yourself, well, I don't know what I want. I don't know what my purpose or passion or life mission is. That's okay. Just admit it. And then start the process of self-discovery. Let me give you a couple suggestions. First of all, you should invest in the most important thing you know, yourself. Maybe now's the time to get some help from a coach or a counselor. You wouldn't begin to expect to be a pro athlete without coaching. How in the world can you expect to be a pro in life without some help, without some coaching? How much money do we spend on frivolous things, on trappings, to, to grow in our status, to get other people's approval? Instead, spend the money on yourself to get focused, to grow. Another idea, pick one thing one part of your life and commit to being better at it today than you were yesterday. Now, be a little bit better tomorrow than you were today. Do this over a lifetime, you'll be awesome at whatever you choose. Reading, reading is a great place to start. I don't think I read a book a year. Now, I read about a book a week. Now, I'm not saying you run out of here today and quit your job. Now, I did do that and I now own a recruiting company. I don't love everything about my job, but I do love working with people, helping people. I love continually adding to my network. I love helping people find and develop their true purpose. From this perspective, my job gives me what I want. It also allows me to have a much bigger impact on the people that I work with. You know, I could have gone 40, 45 years and retired and died. I had no idea that I was living a life that was a fraction of as fulfilling as it could have been, and as it is today. And I often wonder how many other people are doing that same thing, running endlessly on their treadmill of life, trading their time, their limited time, for money, over days and weeks and months and years, or decades, in a way that doesn't light their fire. What a shame it doesn't have to be that way. We need better from you. Your family, your friends, they need better from you. You, you need better from you. So let's break free. I did it at 45 years old. It's never too late to figure out what you're passionate about. And I think in today's diverse economy, you can, you can make a living chasing your dreams. You have great potential, potential to achieve, to, to push yourself and to grow, to to serve others and to love others, and to be great, to design your own life. Let's go do it. Thank you.